In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. This week we finish the last of our series of videos with Holy Week, beginning with Hosanna, Palm Sunday, and ending with Easter. This series commemorates the week or the last week of the life of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. To begin with, I'd like to read you an excerpt from the book Tamar Yesus regarding Palm Sunday. A miracle which our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ performed, may his compassion and mercy be with us forever. Amen. Then, when our Lord Jesus Christ had finished giving this commandment, he called two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you. You will find a barren, a barn on the western side of the village, and its door faces east. There is a vineyard there, and you will find a tethered donkey along with its foal. Upon the foal, no one at all has ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. If any contentious people that you shall find there ask you about the matter concerning the foal and say, why are you untying the foal? Tell them the Lord needs it. Then they will leave you alone and not prevent you. Those disciples went into the village and found the barn. The feature of the door that faces east, the vineyard and the donkey with its foal just as the Lord Jesus Christ had told them, and they untied the foal. Then some of the bystanders asked them, Why are you untying it? The disciples told them, Because our Lord commanded us to send him this foal. Immediately they left them alone. No one prevented them, and they returned to our Lord Jesus Christ with the foal. When all the disciples saw the foal, they took of their garments and threw them onto it. Then our Lord Jesus Christ mounted it, entered the Mount of Olives, and from there went onwards towards Jerusalem. At that time, the disciples saw the gates of heaven open. They looked again at the wilderness there, and it shone and became bright. They also saw the sun bowing down before the fall, which our Lord Jesus Christ rode. Angels descended from heaven and encircled the fall. And on account of the light of our Lord Jesus Christ, all of Jerusalem lit up, so much so that the men of the city thought that Jerusalem was ablaze. They came out of their houses to see the wonder which amazed them. And the woman came out with their babies and infants and received our Lord as he rode the foal. The babes and infants saw the light upon our Lord Jesus Christ and the angels encircling the foal. Immediately, the righteous spirit of prophecy descended upon them. They went speedily to the palm and olive trees and cut down branches from them carried them in their hands and said in loud voices, Hosanna in the highest heaven, Hosanna in the highest heaven, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna, blessed is the one who is in the highest heaven. He who has come to us now by the way of humanity and shall come again in the name of the Lord. The praises of the infants were united with the praises of the angels. It resounded around the whole city of Jerusalem, and those who were dwelling in it trembled. The Jewish rabbis went out to investigate into the manner of that sound and outcry, and beheld a great and holy glorification taking place. They asked the infants, Who taught you this glorification with which you are glorifying in the son of Joseph. 
for this glorification is due to none other than the Lord alone. Who is this king that is coming? The infant said to the Jewish rabbis, O blind of heart and eye, do you not see the angels and how they bow down to the son of the Virgin Mary? Have you not noticed that the sun is on the earth? Have you not read the prophecy of the prophet David, which says, out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have prepared your praise. But the rabbis asked them, who taught you to carry olive branches and palms before him? The infants answered and said, the prophet David taught us to do this and prophesied about these branches. Understand, O blind men, for this man who has come riding upon a foal is the Messiah of God, and he is the firstborn son of God. He is the son of Our Lady Mary, according to the flesh, and he has come now for our salvation. Have you not read the prophecy of the prophet Zechariah, which says, Rejoice, O daughter of Jerusalem. Be glad, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king comes to you, meek and lowly, riding upon the foal of a donkey. Remove this jealousy and wrath from yourselves and understand that he is the savior of the world. Cut down branches from these great trees Unite your voices with our voices and glorify him with us and the angels. When the Jewish rabbis perceived that the infants would neither listen to them nor fear their reproofs and would not forsake glorification of our Lord Jesus Christ, they were afraid with great dismay. Then they said to one another, Come, let us go to this man and inform him that the glorification is not due to him, but to the Lord alone so that, they, that he may command these infants to be quiet. But the Lord Jesus Christ said to them, If these infants should have kept silent regarding my glorification, I would have commanded the stones that they would glorify the Son of Man. Have you not read the prophecy of the prophet David, which speaks of this day? When our Lord Jesus Christ said these words, stones came bounding over the Mount of Olives. They reached the Valley of Jehoshaphat, crying out with a human voice saying, Hosanna in the highest heaven to our God. Hosanna to our blessed Savior, the one who has come in the name of the Lord. The voices of the stones were united with the voices of the infants and the praises of the angels and great fear, trembling and astonishment took hold of the Jews, and they greatly feared the infants. Now the number of the infants was 10,300. May his compassion and mercy be with us forever. Amen. This reading from the miracles of our Lord, God and Savior Jesus Christ, written by St. John the Evangelist, who wrote in his gospel at the end, that if there were books enough to contain, there would never be books enough to contain the miracles of our Lord, so that he himself composed this book of additional miracles which he witnessed from our Lord. This miracle regarding Palm Sunday clarifies what's written in the gospel. The gospel teaches us that our Lord called his apostles, told them to get the foal, that he would ride upon the donkey and enter into Jerusalem. In some of the accounts, there is both a foal and a donkey. And in the mystery of the church father's interpretation, they say that our Lord rode both the foal and the mother donkey into Jerusalem. Some say that they were 14 kilometers away from Jerusalem and he walked 12 of them and two of them he rode the fall. Still, the point is made clear in the miracle. Zechariah, 
the prophet prophesied about the coming of Christ and his entrance into Jerusalem. And so on Palm Sunday, the church commemorates a very huge event because it's an event where we recognize the Messiah, that our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ is the Messiah of Israel. We consider it to be a doctrine of the church. And yet, what we see today is there are many people who are Jewish who don't believe that the Messiah has even come yet or been born. If we were to look at the Jewish faith, what we would see is that the Jewish faith teaches that they would have a Messiah from the lineage of King David, and that Messiah would enter into Jerusalem and reclaim the city. So Palm Sunday speaks about how our Lord did that. What's important for us, however, is that this wasn't clear to the Jewish people at that time. It wasn't clear who our Lord was. And it wasn't clear because they were blinded. They weren't allowed to see. In the miracle about Palm Sunday, it says that the infants, they spoke to the rabbis and said to them, could they not see the angels? Could they not see the sun had bowed down? It said that all of Jerusalem was bright and filled with light, yet they couldn't see. Metaphorically speaking, this speaks about people who can't see the Messiah, people who can't accept Christ as God, people who are non-believers. People who are non-believers can't see the angels. People who are non-believers can't see the obedience of the sun, the stars, and the moon. People who are non-believers are made to be blind in their hearts. The blindness of the heart is what is the true sickness of man. And so we see that in the Old Testament, the story of Adam and Eve was really a question of the story of how people's hearts became hardened, how people's inner eyes became darkened, how their inner ears became deaf, and so that they could not hear or do the word of God. When we as Christians enter into Himamat, this week of the sufferings of Christ, it records the final days of the life of our Lord on the earth. He was persecuted throughout most of his life from the time of his birth with the King Herod up until the time when he suffered in the Passion Week, this week of Himamat. The word passion in English means suffering. And so Passion Week is the week of the sufferings of Christ. And for all Christians, this is something that is commonly held and believed to be an apostolic tradition that was passed down directly from the apostles. We come to record the acts of Holy Week through the actual readings of the Gospels. And so we read from the Gospel of St. Matthew and the Gospel of St. Luke and Mark and John how they recorded what steps our Lord took up until the time that he was crucified, died, buried, and resurrected. The Passion Week speaks to God's suffering for our sake. And so the suffering of our Lord for our sake doesn't mean that we don't have to suffer at all. But it means that God suffered on behalf of our nature, on behalf of our kind, on behalf of Adam. When we speak about Adam and Eve, we're speaking about an archetype, a typical human being. Adam being the first man, he's typical of all of our forefathers. The suffering that our Lord suffered was for the salvation 
of Adam, meaning the salvation of all mankind. What's different now from what was going on then is that now we have the choice to come to God. But then people were bound to Satan. Even if the people did righteous works like Moses and King David and the prophet Isaiah, they were condemned to slavery in Sheol. That people who did good didn't have their goodness recognized. But we today, when we do good, we're rewarded for it. And so in a very prophetic sense, when our Lord spoke to Cain, who killed his brother Abel, he said to him, if you do good, won't you be blessed? We have to realize that when we do good, we get a blessing. Christian life for us, brothers and sisters, means to seek after a blessing from God. Doing good and seeking that blessing is what the Jewish people were supposed to do. The infants even told them that they should repent and just join their voices to the voices of the angels and praise God. And so during this week, we remember that the condition of man was in prison. The man who was made first, Adam, and all his children were considered to be slaves of Satan. And our Lord marched into Jerusalem and then rode a donkey in to show that he was coming to liberate his children. Another theme that's important for us is a theme that is taken out of the works of St. Paul and his writing to his disciples. St. Paul in Romans says that when you want to make your enemy unhappy. You should just simply do good things for him. The apostles, St. Matthew and Luke, they also said, love your enemy, do good. These were the teachings of our Lord on the Mount of Olives. And so what we see is that love is a way of conquering evil. And that our Lord conquers the devil through his love for us. By loving us enough to die on the cross, he was able to capture Satan. The fathers of the church, they teach that when our Lord was on the cross, he said, I thirst. And that his crucifixion on the cross was off of the ground because our Lord, when he was crucified off of the ground between heaven and earth, he freed man from the Satans that lived in the air and the Satans who lived in the abyss, the devils in the abyss. And so our Lord, by dying, on our behalf, conquered the devil. And he said, I thirst because Satan, throughout his entire life, had wondered whether or not he was the one who had been prophesied about. But when our Lord went into the wilderness and fasted, he saw that his body became emaciated and hungry. And he thought, well, if he were the son of God, he wouldn't be hungry and his body wouldn't be weak. Similarly, on the cross, when our Lord said he thirsted, Satan thought to himself, he's just a human being. I can conquer him and take his soul. And it was at that point that our Lord bound Satan. The tradition within the interpretation of the Gospels, in particular the Gospel of St. Matthew, what it says is that when our Lord said, I thirst, and Satan came near to him, there was a dialogue between the two of them. 
that dialogue was basically a dialogue about whether or not Satan was justified in taking his soul. And when Satan approached our Lord, our Lord brought about all of the accusations that had come to him at the hand of Satan. It was Satan who made Herod jealous of our Lord and seek after him to kill 144,000 children. It was Satan who moved the hearts of the Jewish elders to be jealous of him and to seek ways to kill our Lord. And it was Satan who moved Judas to betray our Lord for 30 pieces of silver. <clears throat> there are a couple of traditions that speak about how Judas came, came about this 30 pieces of silver. One is that in the Old Testament time, when the Queen of Sheba went to the King Solomon to visit and seek his wisdom, she had a clubbed foot and that one of her feet was injured and she was a beautiful woman, but this clubbed foot made her unappealing. When she came into the city, one of Solomon's servants went and told him that she was coming and that she had the foot of a goat. And at the door of the entrance to King Solomon's throne was a piece of wood from the Garden of Eden, a piece of wood from the tree that Adam and Eve had eaten from. And it says that when, our, when the Queen of Sheba walked over this piece of wood, her foot was healed. And at that point then, King Solomon saw her and saw that his servant was lying. And he went and asked them to come back and say why they had lied about this queen having the foot of a goat. And they confirmed with everyone that she had been healed by the wood. And they each took two pieces of silver and attached a ring and put that silver on the wood as like a form of payment or tribute. And after Solomon, there were 28 kings of Israel between the time of Christ and the time of King Solomon. And they each put one piece of silver there. And it is said that from this piece of wood with the silver, they took the 30 pieces of silver and they paid it to Judas and they took the cross and they crucified our Lord. These traditions speak to the intentionality of what was done at the time our Lord was crucified. Everything was done very intentionally. It wasn't a mistake. They intended to crucify him because they were jealous. They intended to do faults and do bad things to him throughout his ministry because they hated his authority and the way he taught. And so leading up to the crucifixion, we see that everything had its place in the prophecy of the Old Testament and the coming of the Messiah. And so on Palm Sunday, we commemorate that our Lord and Savior is truly the Messiah of Israel, the one who would be the Savior, the one who would lead the people into the Promised Land, and he was truly the Christ, the one who was anointed. Let's think about the Promised Land for a minute. What is the Promised Land for us as Christians? Is the Promised Land something that we have a, a place for ourselves where we're comfortable, where we're uh, living and indulging our flesh? Or is the Promised Land a place where we're like the infants who praised along with the angels? The role in place of Adam and Eve was to be in Mangista Samayat to replace Satan. And so our Lord being crucified on the cross, his crucifixion and his death frees Adam and Eve to enter back into the kingdom of heaven 
on the day of judgment. Had our Lord not been crucified and died on behalf of Adam as the second Adam, all human beings would be condemned to stay outside of the kingdom of heaven in their fleshly state. But each of us has something to look forward to. That is, that we are not simply flesh and blood, but that we are also made in the image and likeness of God. And our Lord in the Gospel of St. John chapter 6 promises us that if we believe and we eat his flesh and we drink his blood, we will have eternal life. We will no longer just be in the image and likeness of God, but we would receive spiritual bodies that are eternal. And so this week, we commemorate the suffering of our Lord. How from the time of Monday, the Jews betrayed and conspired against our Lord. And by Wednesday, they told Judas what he would have to do. And they consolidated their plan. And then he went and received the 30 pieces of silver and betrayed our Lord on Thursday in the Garden of Gethsemane. And how then our Lord was taken before Pilate and Herod and then accused falsely and his life was traded for the life of Barabbas. Barabbas, according to the tradition, was the brother-in-law of Judas and that it was his sister who convinced him to give the 30 pieces to take the 30 pieces of silver and to trade our Lord for the release of her husband, Barabbas, who was a criminal. And so during this week then, on Saturday, it is said that our Lord entered into Sheol to free Adam and Eve. And so when our Lord went down into Sheol to free them, he set them free with Adam saying, stand up for prayer and the people responding, Lord, have mercy upon us when he, when he appears. And when he appears, he says, peace be unto you all, waving his hands, and the blood from his hands baptizes them, and they say, and with thy spirit. And so the peace that our Lord gave to them on that day has been with us since that time, and the teaching of the church fathers, the holy apostles, is that we commemorate this time of Passion Week, knowing that our Lord is with us and that he keeps us and that he will come again on the Day of Judgment. And so on the early morning, just like our Lord will come in the early morning to judge, our Lord resurrected and he was greeted by the women who were in the tomb. So during this week of Holy Week, we recount the life of our Lord. We recount the presence of our Lord in Jerusalem, the entry as the Messiah, and how he finished his life on Friday and resurrected and told us of his second coming. May God keep us during this time from all sickness and illness. And may he make us return again to this time of the year in safety and peace in the following year as he did at this hour. Amen. <laughs>